Hello everyone, greetings from the 7th of Nero, AJ here, and this one's going to be almost completely bereft of artwork, as it covers something that, by virtue of the medium of presentation, is barely represented in pictorial form, and that is the um, languages of the peoples of Amoran. One can point to the runes that appear when sorcerers or war casters cast magic, but it has been well established that these runes are not a representation of the language that the magic user in question speaks or reads, whether natively or otherwise. For the players, these runes are an easter egg. Where they're shown in the artwork, they are almost all direct ciphers from English to a non-indicative runic alphabet that tells us, as non imeries and players of the game, what the spell or feat being cast is. In world, what observers would see are runes that represent the user's points of focus for casting said spell, or feats which would require specialised skills or abilities to interpret. As best as we can tell, all bar one of the runic alphabets bear absolutely no relation in any way, shape or form with daily used language, except in the most circuitous of coincidences, and the uh, same applies to resemblances to each other. It is better to consider them as variants of the runes shown in Warlock's artwork, which are generally indeterminate glyphs with no apparent meaning. By the creator's own admission, aside from these runic alphabets, the written and spoken languages as used by the pupils of Imoran were not given full or even partial treatment in terms of providing them with associated phonetics, etymology, lexicography, grammar, syntax or graphemics beyond what would reasonably occur to an author, as they provide a narrative of individuals corresponding, whether by speech or by script, in an array of languages not named but described. Thus, herein will be covered the known features, demographics and dynamics of the main languages as spoken by the major races of Amoran and the main playable factions of War Machine and Hordes, with a couple small exceptions. The oldest languages of Amoran that have established histories are undoubtedly those of the Elves and Dwarves. The Empire of Laos used an archaic but intelligible version of Shear that has changed very little to this day, and it is highly likely that the Elves of Laos and their earliest ancestors would be able to communicate with each other with relative ease. This is largely due to the constancy of their gods who remained in continual communication with their people via the priesthood and then directly when they dwelled upon Cain for some 3,000 years or so. Within the language of Shear are many grammatical rules and aspects not found in other languages of Amoran, making it a surprise when non-Iosans are encountered who speak it, given not only how the elves guard their language, but also how complicated it is. However, after the Rivening and the migration of the Nis away from the Iosan heartlands, a new elven language evolved, and Eric is the language of the northern elves named for their prophet. And though it is not mutually unintelligible with Iosan, the two are different enough that they may be considered separate languages, as opposed to merely dialects. Indeed, their scripts prove them to be different languages. Where Shear and Eric can be spoken with some level of understanding, written Shear and written Eric may as well belong to two different races entirely. Shear is written in logographic form with symbols of varying complexity, whose content does not imply any specific pronunciation, while Eric possesses an intricate alphabet which came about from the adaptation of religious runes. Culturally as well, the two languages hold disparate places within their native speaking populations. The Iosans consider Shear to be merely a functional part of their daily lives, while to the Nis, the use of Eric, especially written Eric, is of great religious importance. Given how the average Nis is generally illiterate, and most texts that use written Eric are associated with the fane of Nisor and gathered Nis lore, it explains why literacy is limited to the priesthood and those who adopt the sorceress traditions. More relevant to the modern era, though, written Eric is preserved by what few priests of Nisor remain alive, now reunited with their southern cousins. Meanwhile, the actual predominant form of written Eric is that used by the blighted Nis sorcerers and Everblight's other minions. It has seen the language corrupted by the influences of draconic rituals and sigils, an effect that continues at the dragon's encouragement, turning blighted Eric into something even further desecrated than it already is. While likely existing as something akin to a dialect continuum across the shards, Eric has few varieties beyond those used by the blighted and non-blighted Nis, not least because the total population of the winter elves was never especially large, and outsiders' necessity or requirement to learn it was always minimal, with most Nis speaking Kardic or a local Skorovi dialect. Unique to Eric, though, is that it even has a blighted counterpart, for no other language has been so willfully defiled in its use. 
Shearer, on the other hand, was spared such influence by Everlight when he undermined Isira. Today, Shear has regional variations, with a major dialect for each of the Ithils that is still well populated, as well as at the border fortresses, where the Shear spoken by the populations that dwell there are quite far removed from the urban centres of the nation. Individual great houses have and use slight differences in vocabulary, but these would be difficult to classify as dialects of their own, more a local vernacular. Ithils such as Ayisthil, Nisathil and Nirathil have no real dialect to call their own anymore, being sparsely populated at best. The first was leveled to the ground when Everblight tried his hand in Ios, the second being the original home of the Nis as one would expect from such a name, and the last having never recovered from the actions of the cult of Nero in the aftermath of the Rivening. The prestige dialect of Shear is undoubtedly that of Lassithil, logically, as Ayas's capital takes its name from the language of its people, and indeed speakers of the capital variety make up the largest proportion of this Shear speaking demographic. Similar to Eric, though, few outsiders know or even consider learning Shear, especially if there is no ulterior motive to do so. With the retribution at large, not many have earned enough respect among the Iosans to be able to learn and speak Shear without causing offence. Conversely, the dwarves are certainly not the only population who freely speak the Rulic language. Their Ogren neighbours and fellow clan folk are almost all fluent in Rulic to some degree, though not all are capable of writing it. In addition, the Ogren also speak their own native language, a variant of Molga, Molga Og. However, because of the level of integration of the Ogren communities among the dwarven clans, Molga Og is becoming a marginalised language, reserved only for intimate and family matters, while they will speak in Rulik in public, even amongst fellow Ogren. Rulik and its dwarven law written counterpart, Rul Runic, are descended from Dol Rul, the original language of the Great Fathers, but it is no longer spoken by the dwarves of the modern era. Alone among the major languages of Imoran, Rulik has two accepted written forms, the aforementioned Rul Runic for ritual and formal stone engraving work, and conventional Runic script for daily use, correspondence and other mundane affairs. Rule runic is a complex written form based on patterns of geometric shapes, while daily runic is a much more flowing form. And while both are alphabetized, runes of one do not necessarily equate to letters in the other. Variations of spoken runic exist, with the most distinct being those spoken to the north, away from the great cities or the areas around the dwarven fortifications. But the most notable dialect is minor runic which is spoken by those who have worked away from their homeland for a long time, starting with the Rulik workers who settled in the Iron Kingdoms in the aftermath of the Rebellion Era, starting off in the mines, giving rise to the dialect's name. Hundreds of years and a few generations have led to a mildly divergent form of Rulik that is, nonetheless, fully intelligible with native Rulik. As noted, the Ogren generally speak a descendant language from ancient Molga. The other Dunian races all speak their own variants of Molga, as do many cultures of Devourer Worm. But while the Molga languages share common ancestry, they are nonetheless highly divergent in so much that written forms vary from non-existent, as in the case of as in the case of the Ogren's Molga Og, to extremely flexible and expressive, as in the case of the Trollkin's Molga Trull. When more civilized speakers of Molga languages wish to codify one thing or another but lack a writing system, they generally borrow from another local language. For example, written Molga Og in Rule uses the Rulik alphabet, while urban born and raised Tolkien generally use the Signaran alphabet, out of convenience, it being more prosaic than the Tolkien's more poetic native runes, considering its use on the sacred creel stones. Unlike both Og and Trull variants of Molga, followers of the Devourer Worm, the Than in particular, speak a Molga much more closely related to its predecessor. Aside from a great deal of appropriated terminology, mostly from Kurzic languages, comparatively little separates the Tuath's Molga Tharn from ancient Molga. On a much different note is Gobberish, though anyone with intellectual inclinations would hesitate to call Gobberish a language. A Molga-derived method of speaking, shall we say, used by the Gobbers, as the name would suggest, Gobberish is a largely unwritten creole that integrates a great deal of local vocabulary, the most common being Signoran, given that the largest populations of gobbers can be found there. Often used as a source of mischief as much as communication, gobbers' human neighbours have difficulty learning gobberish, not only because of the unfamiliar Molga roots, but also because gobbers delight in speaking at speeds designed to bewilder or even annoy their listeners. They revert to Signoran when they've had their fill of fun. Sharing a similar background to Molga is Kuor, 
Like Tmolga, the Kuwar language itself is dead, but aspects live on in the descendant but still closely related Kuwar Og and Kuwar Gar languages, spoken by the Bogchogs and Gatorman respectively. Surprising to most who encounter them is the lingual flexibility of the Faro. While they have their own language, Grun, it is a relatively young language by comparison with the others spoken in Imoran, due in large part to the youth of the Faro as a race, one hesitates to say civilised race. Because of the Faro propensity for abnormally rapid re evolution, they adapted to using language both quickly and easily. Faro physiology restricting their ability to replicate certain sounds notwithstanding, many Faro have a competent grasp of multiple languages. As for Grin itself, it is a result of the Faro's own background, with the largest populations around Signoran lands, and their biology, thus giving rise to a combination of Signoran vocabulary adapted for the Faro voice and distinctly poor sign phonemes, if you wish to be charitable. It has no written forms, but the more intellectually inclined among the Faro use the Caspian alphabet or borrow liberally from Mulga runes. Moving further east, only one widely spoken language is of any real note to linguists. The giants are known to have their own language, but they number so few and are insular to the extreme, allowing no opportunity for outsiders to study it, and consequently, nothing is codified about the giant's language, even its name. The Afarit also have their own language, about which we at least know its name, Blati. But like the giants, the nomadic Afarit are highly insular, even towards each other, and learning their language from them is next to impossible due to the very alien nature of their culture and their attitudes towards outsiders. This leaves the language of the Scorn. Strongly linked to the Scorn ethnicities, there are three broad dialects, though many regional, if minor, variations exist. The politically dominant group of dialects is the Havati variant, which is spoken by the urban and western Scorn, while the other two, Kurdish and Sorish, are divided among the rural, nomadic and eastern populations. Sorish is peculiar for being a closely related but linguistically rustic and scholastically vulgar form of Havati. Havati is named for the first individual who made a concerted effort to formalise the core aspects of the scorn vocabulary, syntax, and grammatical conventions used by those who are literate. It took the form of an epic retelling of the War Over the Exalted. The five major scorn ethnicities utilise one or more dialects in some combination that is particular to them. Without a doubt, the Havati spoken by the Malzash ethnic group is the prestige dialect among the scorn, given that the leaders of most of the great houses are Malzash. Almost without exception, the Malzash look down on the other dialects and their speakers. More conciliatory with respect to language are the Kadamesh of the southeast, the most populous of the Scorn ethnic groups. The Kadamesh generally speak both Havati and Kadesh, as is common in the east, doing so with notable languidness. In turn, they're southern cousins of the Qajar, who are perhaps the furthest from the Malzash, both in terms of culture and bloodlines, are the almost forgotten speakers of Kadesh, though their significant presence around the Mirketh Lake means most speak at least passable Havati, albeit with a marked accent. Sorish is the dialect of the Sultani and their cousins the Kazultan. Both have nomadic roots and while the Sultani have remained nomadic, the Kazultan became a splintered ethnicity that settled in and around the rather inhospitable Valley of Kornash. Stereotyped by Malzash nobility as rural to the point of being a sign of boorishness, Sorish is intelligible with Havati, provided the Sorish speaker slows down sufficiently, upon which the differences become clear. It is a sharper language when spoken, with a simpler alphabet when written. And for the Sultani, speaking Sorish is a point of honour and solidarity, usually in spite of knowing urban Havati. The Kazultan, when they split from the Sultani, lost much of their antagonism with and knowledge of Havati, except among the senior castes. Originating from far to the south, the descendants of the people of Urus are unique as far as language is concerned, due to their capacity and preference for using telepathy to communicate. In most cases, they lack the inclination or even basic knowledge of how to utilise what may be considered a voice, and they have had a long history of using mind-to-mind -mind transfer of information, which apparently uses a semblance of linguistic convention, but it is impossible for us to codify. This was one of the many evolutionary steps born from the development of cephalomech, the biomechanical science practiced by these cephalics.
The high caste epilects have evolved to such a state that, for the majority, physically speaking is tremendously difficult without suitable external means to facilitate audible speech. Instead, normal practice when speaking to non cephalics is to blend their psychic power with their correspondent own interpretation of the relayed concepts to psychically mimic the presentation of spoken language. Thus, any apparent lingual quirks are a result of the individual cephalics' mental predilections, rather than any ignorance of the target language, given that they probably do not know said language at all. Concerning ignorance for opposite reasons, a language that most would hesitate to profess any knowledge of is the Kla, which is spoken by Torok, the Dragonfather, and his most senior servants, the Lich Lords. It is the language shared by the dragons, and the Takra speaking demographic is, predictably, extremely small, in terms of numbers, that is, not the physical size of its speakers. While it has a glyph and rune-based script, civilised scholars understandably avoid discussion of Takra, given its direct and intimate association with the dragons, and few, if any, go out of their way to learn it, not least because they would struggle to find either a suitable teacher or much law written in it that its owners, dead or otherwise, would be willing to share. For the rank and file of the Crixians, though, most speak distorted southern dialects of Molga, Og, Molga Trull, Sitixi, or some form of shard tongue, each reflecting their racial backgrounds as Black Ogren, Blighted Cholkin, Sitixis, or Human, respectively. It should be mentioned, however, that the Molga Trull of the Blighted Cholkin is not analogous to Blighted Eric, since it is simply an evolved variant that came about to better suit Blighted physiology and temperament, rather than to imbue a script with draconic corruption to serve as a superior outlet for the dragon's power. Sitixi and Shartang are related to Signarin, albeit in different ways, and are otherwise very different languages. Where Sitixi is pleasant to listen to compared to Signarin, and its distinct alphabet shares some similarities with Caspian, Shartang is derived from the sailor's vernacular of Signarin, with innumerable influences from virtually every other major language spoken by humans in Western Amoran. One should clarify, though, these languages apply to the living rank and file of the Nightmare Empire. The undead, on the other hand, have their own method of speech, such as it is necessary thanks to their lack of lips or other vocal apparatus, or sufficiently functioning brain, as the case may be. Consequently, the unimaginatively named thrill speak, also used by the Lichords and Iron Liches when dealing with their undead underlings instead of their master, is abominable to speak to, difficult for non Christians and even many living Christians to understand, and virtually impossible for the living to mimic without using some form of magic. From the nature of its users, though, scholars infer that, perhaps related in some small way to Takra, it is a simple language with a small vocabulary and straightforward grammar, such that knowledge of it can be easily implanted into thralls upon raising them or summoning them, as is the case for the Bane Casts. Despite there being thrall runes, these do not relate at all to thrall speak, which does not have any known written form. Instead, thrall runes are inscribed orders or necromantic templates used by the Nightmare Empire sorcerers to magically control, command, or raise thralls. Irksome though it is, thrall speak is perhaps the one language capable of uniting all the common races of Amorin, even if it isn't the kind of unification any but Grixian necromancers would welcome.